you want, can you just grab my hands? Here. So, wow, it's been a long day uh, and some amazing talks today. I'm really appreciative of being able to, uh, to speak at this event because some of the things we've heard have been really, really fascinating and stimulating. Um, but really long day. So I understand if you guys want to sort of fall asleep back there. And the, exactly. The, uh, so in thinking about that, I thought about you know, what is the commonality between network science and, and web science. And I realized that it's the two disciplines in the world with the greatest stamina, um, because we can sit through uh, so many talks uh, at once. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about network science. And in thinking about what I would want to see uh, from the last speaker of a 13-hour day, I cut half my slides, which included uh, the, the paper that you wanted to see. <laughs> And then I took the 50% the that remained and I replaced those with jokes. So hopefully we can, we can keep you awake uh, for the rest of the time. So, um, so I basically focus on mining massive network data to understand how behavioral contagions spread in social networks. Okay? And you can imagine that this is relevant for a number of topics, from product adoption to demand, productivity of information workers, and viral marketing, but also things like the spread of disease, the spread of HIV, or even economic development, as, as uh, Michael was talking about. Um, and one of the key uh, uh, you know, endeavors in researching this topic, when you talk about contagion, uh, is really causality. Right? So peer-to-peer -peer influence. When you see something cascading through a population, is it that one peer is influencing the other to take on that behavior, or is there something else going on? So I have this cartoon on my door in my office, and it's two friends talking, and one says, I used to think correlation implied causation, then I took a statistics class, and now I don't. And the, the, guy, the friend says, it sounds like the class helped, and the guy goes, well, maybe. Right? And the idea is maybe he's selected into this statistics class because he has a proclivity to understand statistics and the class isn't really teaching him uh, to understand this difference as much as uh, this friend might think. Um, so in, in network science, uh, this is known in part as the reflection problem. So identifying causal peer effects is notoriously difficult in networks. Uh, we now have lots of empirical evidence that behaviors tend to cluster in network space and in time. So even in longitudinal data, people that are linked tend to exhibit the same behaviors and also tend to exhibit these behaviors at approximately the same time. Uh, but the real question here is that, is, is this because of peer influence or some alternate explanations uh, of these you know, cascading type behaviors. And one potential alternate explanation is obviously homophily, right? So uh, birds of a feather tend to flock together. And this was originally attributed to Robert Burton in the 1500s. So this is a long line of theory that postulates this. And it's even older than Robert Burton, because before Robert Burton, it was Aristotle who was saying that you know, people love those who are like themselves. And, before Aristotle, it was Plato who was saying that you know, similarity begets friendship. And just to prove to you that this is a long line of worthy scholars that have made this argument, it was my mom who said that hanging out with a bad crowd will get you into trouble. Um, <laughs> she was none too pleased when I told her that, that she might have gotten the causal structure of this statement wrong. Uh, she thought that was sort of talking back. Um, <laughs> So, OK, so the reason why homophily matters is that if people tend to make friends with people that are like themselves, then they might have correlated preferences. And even if you have longitudinal data, they might engage in the same behaviors at approximately the same time, just on their own decision making, not because one friend is influencing the other. And so ironically, Slate wrote an article uh, which was ironically about the contagion of contagion studies amongst academics. Um, and you know, it cited all of these papers that we all know, that obesity is contagious, and happiness is contagious, and product adoption is contagious, and cooperation is contagious, and loneliness is contagious. And the mainstream ma media picks up these uh, studies that we, that we conduct, and they write front page New York Times Magazine articles like, are your friends making you fat? Right, which is clearly a causal statement. It's not about the correlation, and sometimes they don't pick up the subtleties of whether correlation is causation, et cetera. But there are a lot of alternative explanations for these kinds of correlations, homophily being just one of them, uh, the reflection problem being about 
uh, identifying individual change and separating it from group means, uh, dynamic processes, right? The umbrella example that we had earlier today. If I cut the price of something and, it, and that price reduction sort of follows a geographic pattern, then maybe you'll observe some correlation amongst linked nodes, et cetera. And the reason why separating these two things out is so important uh, is because the causal structure of the underlying dynamic process that explains the cascade can imply different diffusion properties for the behavior, where it's going to go next, as well as different optimal containment or promotion policies for the behavior, right? So uh, if, for instance, homophily fully explains the diffusion of a behavior through a population, then uh, where it's going to go next can be predicted by just segmenting the population based on characteristics that you can observe and knowing what the likelihood of adoption of that behavior is given those characteristics. But if it's peer influence, then that might not depend on the characteristics of individuals. At the same time, you might have very different optimal containment and promotion policies. A peer-to-peer -peer policy of promotion or containment is only going to work if there is actually peer influence in the process, right? So this has dramatic implications for marketing strategy, for public policy. If you want to have a smoking cessation program that's based on peer-to-peer -peer influence, we should have good parameter estimates about the degree to which smoking behavior is induced by peers' behavior or not, right? And it's true for organizations as well. So in observational data, there's a lot of different ways that people have tried to get at this problem, right? So there's peer effects models, which are essentially extended spatial autoregressive models that use uh, variation in group size or structure as an instrumental variable to identify uh, peer influence. There are actor-oriented models that are really attributable to Tom Snyder's at Oxford that model the micro decisions that maximize behavioral and network utility and then use panel network data and Markov chain Monte Carlo methods to try to estimate selection and influence as a dynamic process. Uh, there are natural experiments or instrumental variables. There are uh, structural modelers that use the, uh, the precise functional form of a utility function and use assumptions about, for instance, the distribution of priors to identify peer influence. Uh, and we introduced this paper that, uh, that Michael was referring to at the break uh, in PNAS in 2009. And basically what we do in that paper is we take uh, as a treatment those people with N friends who have adopted the behavior at or before time t, and we compare that uh, to a control group who is as likely to have N friends who have adopted the behavior at or before time t, but who don't have those N friends. So we first build a model of the likelihood of having that friend from observable data, and then we compare those that do and those that don't by matching those who are as likely to have a friend, which should control for some of these confounds and some of this homophily. Now, the reason we think this is good is because uh, it scales with more data. The more I observe about people, the better my predictive model of the likelihood of having a friend, the better my match sample, and the better I can sort of isolate uh, estimates of peer influence. The, these type of models uh, break as the, as the data get bigger, right? Because it's very difficult to estimate these models on large networks. So these types of models scale with data. The limitation of these types of models is it's all dependent on how good your observable data is in predicting the likelihood of having a friend who's adopted the behavior. If you're, so in this paper, we have 40 variables varying in time uh, to describe each person, including their browsing behavior online which gives you a lot of precise estimates about their preferences. With that, we can create good matches to control for homophily. If you don't have that data, this method is very limited. Okay? Now, all of these methods uh, use observational data and try to mimic exogenous variation. Right? So what this, all of these methods are trying to do is trying to mimic what you would achieve in a randomized trial, which is that the two people that you're examining are the same on all dimensions in expectation. Okay? So as Michael mentioned, one of the sort of holy grails of this type of research is really doing massive randomized trials in networks. Okay? And we have a paper that's now conditionally accepted at Management Science that describes one randomized experiment, and that's what I want to sort of tell you about today. Okay? So this paper looks at viral product design. Okay? A lot of the contagion studies that you've seen 
uh, are about uh, looking at a product and seeing how it diffuses over the network and is the adoption contagious. So we want to go a step further and say, don't take an existing product like a shoe or, a, or an iPhone, but before you design the product, can firms design products so that they're more likely to go viral? Can they build the product in a way that's more likely to create peer influence in the diffusion process? And if so, which product features are the most effective in inducing peer-to-peer -peer influence? Okay? So uh, that's the definition of viral product design, the process of explicitly engineering products so they're more likely to be shared amongst peers. And there's really two dimensions of this. Viral product characteristics, which are, what is it about that YouTube video with a funny guy dancing that makes it go viral? What is it about the content that makes people want to share it? And there have been a lot of, there have been some studies about this, like for instance, some studies of what is the content of the most likely to be emailed newspaper articles in the New York Times, the ones that hit that top 10 most emailed list. Or uh, there was a study in here about um, which urban legends are the most likely to spread, and it turns out uh, that the disgusting urban legends are the most likely to be viral, which says something about our society. But, um, so there's some research on what is it about a product that makes it go viral, but in terms of viral product features, there's really almost no literature. And what viral product features are, are modalities of use with respect to sharing the product with your friends, okay? So for instance, what we study is Facebook, an application on Facebook, and things that might be viral features are the ability to invite your friends to adopt the application, or notifications that as you're using the application, tell your friends what you're doing on the application, which spreads awareness of the product, associates your using the product, your use with the product, so your friends say, hey, Sinan is using the product. It's not just about Facebook, okay? Remember Hotmail. When Hotmail was launched, at the bottom of every email, there was a link that said, get your free Hotmail account at www.hotmail.com. Every time somebody sent an email, it was advertising the product to their friends or whoever was receiving the email and giving a path to product adoption through the link that you would click on to get to the, to get to the product, okay? And you can imagine that even the most sort of non-technical things could be notifications. If I wore a shirt that said, I went to the Sonic workshop, and I went back to school and I started wearing it, that would be sort of a viral feature for this workshop because it would associate my, you know, using the product uh, and advertise that to the people that saw me or knew me, okay? And I have other examples as well and it's, and it's in the paper. So what type of features are likely to be the most effective? Well, there's a lot of theory that says the active personalized features are likely to be more effective. If I personally invite you to the product, I'm likely to activate my strong ties. This is likely to exhibit homophily, so you're likely to have the same preferences as, as me. There's greater pressure for conformity, there's deeper knowledge of one another's interests, there's, we tend to trust information from our close trusted sources, etc. But these types of messaging channels also require more effort. I actually have to think about who to invite. I have to actually go through the process of inviting them. Maybe I spend some social capital by asking them to do something, et cetera. On the other hand, passive broadcast messaging is more likely to reach more people. More of these messages will be sent. More people will be aware of it. But each message may not be as effective per message in bringing someone to the product. So which of these is more effective is sort of an empirical question and one that we want to test in this paper. So we, we sort of uh, uh, outlined this viral feature space. It's not comprehensive. There are probably a lot of other dimensions on which we could describe viral features or aspects of viral product design. But the two that we talk about are personalization and activity. So along this dimension, personalization is increasing. The feature is targeting specific individuals. And along this dimension, activity is increasing. It requires more effort for me to engage this feature. Okay? So the two things that we study are personalized referrals, which are very targeted and require a lot of effort from me. And these automated broadcast notifications, which require no effort from me except for the normal use of the application and target you know, lots of different people without me choosing who to target. Okay? 
Now, just so we're aware of exactly what these are, personalized referrals are I click a button and I invite my friends to the product. Automated broadcast notifications are I'm using the product and it sends notifications to my friend's Facebook feed saying Sinon just did X on this application. Okay? And I'll describe those in more detail. So how do we set up this experiment? We take the application and we randomly divide people who adopt the application into control and experimental groups. The control groups have, uh, sorry, the experimental groups have viral messaging channels randomly enabled, and the control groups have these channels disabled. So this control group user has three friends, and the dotted lines mean that those channels are turned off for them. This experimental group user has three friends, and those channels are turned on. And then we observe the adoption and use of the application by friends of control and experimental groups. Okay? So the data that we have, we now have data, profile and network data dynamically for more than 10 mi million people. In this particular experiment that I'm going to report, we have 10,000 experimental users, and they have 1.4 million friends. Okay? And the key thing in this paper, which uh, which you'll see at the end of the talk is that we observe not only application adoption and therefore diffusion, but also use of the application. How sustained is your engagement with the application and your use, which becomes really critical to the last result of this paper. Okay, so just to recap, here's what we do. Users adopt the application. Okay, we randomly assign them to control and experimental groups. We collect their data on their personal attributes, their preferences from their Facebook profiles as well as their social networks and the personal attributes and preferences of their network neighbors. We then have this control group and this experimental group. In the experimental group, viral messaging is enabled. Uh, experimental users send active and passive viral messages to their neighbors. In the control group, viral messaging is disabled. Okay? We also, we should note, uh, randomize the receipt of the passive viral messages. So only a randomly selected subset of neighbors receive passive viral messages. And what this allows us to do is run a second randomized trial on the susceptibility to peer influence upon receipt of a notification. Because the person there isn't choosing who to send the message to. And everybody who is friends with a given individual is probably as likely to be homophilous with them as their random neighbor who may or may not receive a message. Okay? So, oops. So then we compare the click-throughs, adoption, and usage data of neighbors of the experimental and control groups. And what this allows us to do is test two things. The average treatment effect of viral messaging capabilities on peer adoption and network propagation, and randomized trials of susceptibility to peer influence via viral messaging. Duncan. How do you, how do you stop, how do you prevent your control and experimental group from getting collided? Contamination and leakage. I'm going to discuss it specifically because that is one of the two most important difficulties of network experiments. The other one is how do you measure contagion. I'm going to talk about those two things. Because I want this to be broad about also how do you do network experiments and what are some of the pitfalls that we encountered in doing this network experiment and that was one of the key ones. Okay. So this application is a competitor to Flickster. It's a commercial grade application that was developed for a real client by the firm that we worked with. It is a movie based application where you can rate movies, see your uh, friends ratings, friends celebrities, uh, buy movie tickets, see show times, etc. And what you can do is you can have friends on this application itself and users can invite their friends to the application uh, by clicking on invite buttons that are put throughout the application. Okay? So for people who have invites turned on, they have a button to invite their friends. When they click on it, they can find their friends by searching for them. They can filter through a list of all their Facebook friends. They can put specific email addresses here uh, for, for inviting. And then they can write a personal note about why they should adopt this application. Okay? So that's one form of viral messaging. The other one is notifications, and so it would appear in the notification stream of Facebook if I rated Terminator 2, all my friends would see, or some randomly selected subset of my friends would see, a message that says, uh, Sinan just rated Terminator 2 on this great movie application. You can adopt it here. Uh, link. Okay? So that's notifications, which is passive broadcast awareness, and the other one is invitations. Okay? When you click on either one of these, you get taken to an application canvas page which tells you about the application, what it does, what you can do with it, and then gives you the option to adopt the application. Okay? 
So what we have is we have this baseline group, this passive notifications group, and this uh, active personalized invitations group. And then we want to test the adoption and use of the application by the friends of these groups. And as Duncan correctly points out, one of the problems in this kind of network experiment is, since we know people are connected, uh, that there's, there could be contamination or leakage of the control and experimental groups. So there could be, uh, they could connect through multiple indirect pathways. You could have multiple, you could be connected to multiple treated peers in the same treatment group. Uh, or multiple treated peers in different treatment groups. So here's a guy who has multiple treated peers, one in treatment group one and one in treatment group two. Here's a peer with multiple uh, uh, treated friends all in the same treatment group. So the first thing we did was we tried to see in data, well, how often does this happen? And the first thing to note is that this is quite rare in our scenario. Okay? But we still want to be conservative and control for this. So what we did was we controlled for leakage uh, by only evaluating recruited users and then right censoring any contaminated peers. Okay? And here's how we define contaminated peer. It's any peer with multiple treated peers at the time at which they have multiple treated peers. Okay? So for instance, here's a, an initial user has two friends. This person adopts at T0, this person adopts at T1, this person adopts at T2. As soon as this person adopts, this person becomes contaminated because now they have multiple treated peers. Here's the same situation in which these two are unconnected. When this person adopts, this person is, is not contaminated at T1 as they would be in this case. Okay? So this may make our results a little bit more conservative in the sense that we're right censoring people that might be influenced, but it makes sure that these parameter estimates are free from contamination and leakage. Okay? So that's a, one really important part of how do you design a network experiment in a way to recover robust parameter estimates. The other important thing is how do you estimate contagion? The typical way that people estimate contagion is what's called uh, outside in. Okay? So you want to estimate the likelihood of this person's adoption or their hazard rate of adoption as a function of their number of friends who have adopted the product or behavior in the past. Okay? So, you know, why uh, adopts at time t, conditional on not having adopted before, as a function of their own characteristics and some social you know, weighted you know, uh, connection to other people who have adopted. How many friends, how many adopter friends do you have at that time? Okay? The problem uh, with this is that I can't really experimentally control the entire environment around each observation because people have 500 Facebook friends. Right? So what I need to do is I need to treat the person in the middle and then uh, examine the adoption by their friends of the application. Simply because I can't experimentally control the friends of every one observation I have in my data set, that's way too complex to do. Now this creates some modeling challenges. Okay? The first one is that it's unlikely that uh, adoption events are independent in this local network. The time to the second adoption is likely different than the time to a first adoption, and it's probably uh, some adoption process, right? The second one is that these observations are not independent, obviously, as Michael pointed out. So what we sort of describe in the paper as a solution to both of these problems is a variance-corrected stratified proportional hazards model, which is a mouthful of words to say two very simple things. The first is that the baseline hazard varies across adoption events k. So k is like, k equals 1 is the first adopter in your local network. k equals 2 is the second adopter. And we have a separate baseline hazard for each uh, adoption event such that the third it has a separate baseline hazard than the second. And if they're sort of increasing, then you would capture that difference. The other is that it's variance corrected, so we adjust for the correlations that we observe in the network uh, in, the, in the variance matrix. Okay. So what are the, the results of this trial? So what we hypothesized was that invitations, being the most active and personalized, would be the likely to be the most persuasive per message, the most marginally effective. Okay? But uh, broadcast messages are likely to reach more people and so may create more contagion in the network. So what we find in terms of influence per message is that the personal invitations are about three times as effective as the broadcast messages are for generating contagion and peer adoption. Okay? 
But when you look at the global diffusion, personal invitations uh, increase global diffusion by about 98%, but the passive awareness increases it by about 246%. And that's simply a function of more messages uh, being shown and more people adopting the product, even though each message is three times less likely to generate an adoption. There, it's overwhelmed by the number of messages that are being generated. Okay? Now this is the final result of the paper and what I think is the coolest result of the paper that, that really sort of <coughs> struck me. Okay? So, and I'll let you figure it out. <laughs> Yeah. So these three graphs are what I've already shown you. Okay. Basically, this one is the cumulative number of peer adoptions over time for the active, passive, and the baseline case, triple, you know, trickling along down here. The susceptible peer adoption fraction over time for the active, passive, and baseline case. And these are the hazard rates of adoption for the baseline, uh, passive, and active case. Okay. But what this shows you is use of the product. Okay, so every time somebody does something on the application, it logs to our server that they just did X, they just did Y, they're calling the application. Okay, and this is activity per user uh, over time for the baseline, passive, and active cases. Okay, these applications are the exact same, and from the perspective of the user, the only difference between any of these applications are that this one has buttons where you can invite your friends but they have a sustained amount of use of the product more so than passive broadcast and more so than the baseline. So it gets you thinking about, well, why is it the case that uh, you know, a product that is identical except the option to invite your friends generates more use and more sustained use, less churn away from the product, et cetera. And the first thing that came to our mind was network effects, right? network externalities. I get more utility from using the product. I'm having more fun if my friends are also using it. If I can see my friends' movie ratings, if I can see which celebrities my friends like, I'm more interested in it, right? Okay, so that's one possible explanation, but there are lots of alternative explanations that we need to rule out before we can show that this is the case. So, what you see here is that the viral state is correlated with application activity. The active is, creates, is correlated with more application activity than the passive state, which is correlated with more activity than the baseline case, which is what you see in the graph. Okay? But it could just be that this is a function of the fact that um, you know, I am using the notifications feature, and that's what is creating the, uh, the uh, use of the application. Right? What we see is that it's not just the state of the application, but when my friends come to the application, I use it more. So what you see here is that the relationship between the state of the application you received and your own use is not statistically significantly related to your use once you control for how many of your friends join you on the application. And when you control for that, you see that that has the largest magnitude and the most, most precisely estimated relationship with your own use of the application. Each additional friend increases your use by about 60%. Okay? Now, it could just be that this is a function of me hitting the invitation button, right? Because I'm inviting my friends, I am generating more use. Or it could be that as I use the application more, it's generating more passive broadcast messages and more friends are joining. But my friends joining isn't causing me to use the application more. It's my using the application more that's generating more messages and creating peer adoption in my local network. But when you control for the notifications that I'm sending and the invites that I'm sending, peer adoption is still highly correlated and the most highly correlated with my use of the application. Okay? So the number of friends is still the most significant predictor of my use, even controlling for the number of notifications and invitations that I sent. So what do we know about these three variables? We know that feature existence causes peer adoption because we ran a randomized trial of that. That was the first half of the paper. We also know that peer adoption and use can't cause feature existence because we controlled that experimentally. There could be omitted variables that both drive peer adoption and use, 
but maybe I can uh, sort out what is going on there, okay? So what we do in the paper is we draw out all the possible relationships that it could exist between these three variables, and then we, we systematically rule things out based on what we see in the data. So correlation between peer adoption and application use could be ne uh, network effects, like I've argued, but it could also be unobserved heterogeneity, it could be demand effects, the existence of the features drives my use, not peers joining uh, the product, et cetera. But we know that treatment is randomized, so omitted variables can't explain the variation we see in the adoption and use across the treatment groups. Okay? There could still be an interaction effect between some omitted variable and the feature itself, um, but we observe this correlation between peer adoption and application use controlling for how much you use the features, so it's unlikely to be the case unless there's some effect that's related to a demand that you have for a feature that you never use, which seems highly unlikely, okay? So A and B here are cons inconsistent with the discrepancy in application use between the treatment groups, okay? And demand effects, you know, we control for the use of notifications and invites, so these two are also inconsistent with the data. And what's left, these four remaining explanations are, have network effects in the explanation. Okay? And in fact, that's a bit of a conservative view of these results because we've ruled out almost all of the other possible explanations that could exist. So we can conclude that there are definitely network externalities going on, and we can conclude that it's likely that a large portion of the variation in use can be explained by these network externalities. We can't conclude that exclusively network externalities are driving it, but a large proportion. So what does that mean? If you think about it, it means something dramatic for a marketer. It means that if you design a product using viral product design, designing viral features into the product, it creates an increase in contagion. As your friends join you on the application, it increases your use of the application, which generates more viral messages and increases contagion which again increases your use and has this sort of virtuous cycle of use and contagion uh, through adding some simple viral features. And the question is, how effective is this compared to other traditional marketing campaigns, right? Well, we looked at the data, and this is data on click-through rates for email campaigns, the own, our own Facebook banner ad that advertised the original application to people on Facebook, and web banner ads, these two here are published in other people's studies. This is from our study. And these are uh, for viral invitations and viral notifications. You know, for web banner ads, you see sort of a 0.1 to 0.2% click-through rate. For our Facebook banner ad, you see a 0.07 click-through rate. For email campaigns, between a 2 and 6% click-through rate. And for the viral features, 2% for notifications and 6% for invitations, and the thing that makes this result so dramatic, or this statistic so dramatic, is that the numbers in red are conversion rates, not click-through rates, right? This means they actually adopted the product, not clicked on an invitation and then fell off. These are people that actually went and adopted the product. Conversion rates are typically much lower than click-through rates, and so this become, when you consider the virtuous cycle feedback loop and these numbers, it's quite dramatic for a marketer that, that sees this. So there are sort of four findings, and this is the last slide. There are four findings to this study. The first is that uh, viral product design features produce econometrically identifiable peer influence effects and social contagion. This active personalized type features are more effective per message, right? But used much less often and so produce less total peer adoption in the network and less contagion. The data are consistent with the existence of positive network externalities that drive a feedback loop of peer adoption and sustained product use. And viral features outperform traditional banner ads, side out versus outside in, contagion estimation, et cetera. And it's all in the appendix, or part of it is in the paper as well. So thank you very much. We started the session about uh, 20 minutes late. That gives us about 10 minutes for questions. And we'll start in the back. Lincoln. Hey, Sinan. Um, I, that's great. I, I love this study. Um, uh, but 
you know, I think your, your, um, your talk illustrates another point, which is that it's extraordinarily difficult to actually show what people already think they know, right? So, I mean, if, if you sort of talk to uh, people in the, you know, in the, 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 the um, social media marketing world, you know, they'll just state, as a matter of fact, that, you know, that, you know, viral effects are real and that people influence their friends and, you know, and so I can imagine you sort of explaining this to, to a bunch of, to a room full of marketing people and then saying, yeah, we, you're, we already know this. Um, and you've gone to extraordinary lengths to rule out all uh, the, uh, the other kinds of uh, explanations that, that, that might also be true. But, but of course, you know, intuitively, we, we've just already ruled those out because the, the, the story that you actually show is true is the one that's most intuitively satisfying for us to begin with. How do you, do you have to sort of, do you find that you have to first explain to people that they don't already know what they think they know before telling them that they're actually right? Yeah. So really, really good question. And uh, this is a bit of a dialectic between the first five observational type studies that I listed and this one, which is that if you were to take their data on how much contagion there is in their consumer population and apply any of those methods uh, about separating selection from influence and homophily, et cetera, you would first tell them that the estimates that you have on how effective your marketing campaigns are are vastly overestimated. Uh, in our first study, the one that Michael uh, alluded to, by up to 700% overestimated. Okay? Uh, and that's because a lot of the correlations in friends' adoptions are due to these other factors. Okay? And this study shows that, uh, you know, and this study is a little bit different because it's about a firm intervention which changes the product and how that affects the product's diffusion. But this study shows that despite the, uh, the sort of quite now you know, growing evidence that the estimates of contagion in studies that don't adequately control for homophily and selection, et cetera, are overestimated. There's still, and I don't think anyone who does those types of studies would say there's no peer influence in the world, that, you know, our friends don't influence us to do things. Uh, but there's somewhere between this balance of the marketer coming with their sort of Excel spreadsheet and the correlations in their viral campaign and product adoption and these sort of estimates of, you know, there's really no peer influence in the system uh, and what a firm might expect if they intervened and did something like this in the, in the population. The point of all of this work, I think, is just to be very precise and robust in, in what we can expect from a campaign uh, that is peer to peer. Um, thanks, Sinan. I have a question. Um, well, as you said, I mean, the network externality came in your um, experiment is the most important thing. But from the beginning, from the design of your research, you're looking at a Facebook uh, application. From the beginning, we're talking about friends to friends kind of an ecosystem. So basically, it makes sense that network externality would be much more stronger. Like, for example, when we tested information virality in, with videos, with no connection to the Facebook, then we found other kind of stuff. And actually, network externality was very small. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that Facebook is a very particular um, kind of creature, right? It's a creature that, from the beginning, it's a, fa it's a friend to a friend. Therefore, probably, the network externality would be much more stronger, which, which I think goes a little bit to what Duncan was saying. Yeah, so I completely agree with that. I completely agree with that. The parameter estimates of this study don't generalize to peer influence in general. They don't generalize to another product. Uh, I wouldn't claim that you expect to see this type of peer influence with some other product. Okay? But what this study does is it tells you how can I measure in, in, a, in a video appropriately what the, what the peer influence of contagion is or what the other factors might be in the contagion of that particular type of content. And I think that what we need to do now is try to understand the landscape of things that are viral and not viral using methods like this and try to understand, well, what is it about a product that makes it likely to be contagious and under what conditions and when a firm can do uh, something or not. And so in terms of the network externality results specifically, products like, for instance, a movie application where you want to share in that with your friends, you want to plan to go to the movies with your friends, you might expect network externality. Something that doesn't have network externalities, so we're doing uh, experiments like this in South Africa for peer-to-peer -peer HIV testing, uh, encouraging your friends to test. 
And maybe there's stigma associated with encouraging your friends to go for an HIV test. Maybe uh, peer influence is not at all effective uh, in uh, having you, know, you go test for HIV when your friends tell you to. Uh, and maybe you don't want to share that uh, socially. Uh, and so these types of studies can help us figure that out. Michael, and then Peter. Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Anand. Um, I, I see that, that there, you, you find an effect of the number of friends who've adopted. Did you happen to check to see if there's an additional effect of the number of, holding constant the number of friends who've adopted, an effect of the number of ties among those friends? Yeah, so we didn't look at that, but we're looking at that now. So what, we, what we're looking into now is sort of teasing apart some of these, you know, closure arguments. And also, the, the second experiment is all about, well, if I take a person that's randomly sending messages to their friends, then I can see, well, what type of people who are uh, randomly receiving messages are more likely to say yes to that invitation? Do, are women more susceptible to this invitation than men? Are uh, men more influential over women or women more influential over men? What about the young and the old, et cetera. One result that I have, which looks a little bit into detail about this, is susceptibility to influence as a function of your relationship status, right? So whether you're in a relationship, single, engaged, married, et cetera. And what we find is that people who are single are slightly more susceptible than people who don't report their relationship status. People who are in a relationship are slightly more susceptible than people who are single. People who are engaged are slightly more susceptible than people who are in a relationship. And people who are married aren't susceptible at all to peer <laughs> influence, apparently. They never say yes to these uh, invitations. And if it's, if it's complicated, you're the most susceptible to peer influence, apparently. Um, and we debate about sort of why that's the case. Uh, and I proposed to Sanjeev Goyal that Essentially, as you get deeper and deeper into a relationship to the point right before you're married, you have all of these social commitments. If your fiance's father asks you to join an application two weeks before the marriage, you're going to accept that invitation. Uh, but after you're married, your commitments maybe go down and you don't. But he said, he said, you know, Sinan, I think it's very different than that. He said, let me put it to you this way. Uh, I don't do anything without asking my wife first. <laughs> um, so. We're looking into those maybe, exact Maybe the married people have children and don't have any time. No time, exactly, yeah. So we're looking into those very detailed when influence travels over a dyadic relationship and when it doesn't. And closure is one of those conditions. Um, I, I have a small question. If I remember well, uh, uh, when you discussed the correlations, uh, uh, in the bottom of the table there were the, the, was the level of explained variance. And if I remember well, that was very low. So what does that mean for your conclusions? It means that, uh, that uh, the state of the application, the level of notifications and invites that you send, and the number of your friends that, uh, that adopt the application uh, are not as important as unobserved things in explaining how much you use the application. Even though we're controlling here for your overall level of activity on Facebook and other things, there are, there's inter-individual uh, inter heterogeneity that explains a large amount of how much you would use this application or, or not. Um, and I think that that's uh, quite appropriate. Uh, we wouldn't ever claim that network externalities fully explains your use or that the state of the application fully explains your use. But it was very low, so it hardly explains anything then. Well, but the, the point of it is uh, we're not trying to build the best model of someone's use. We're trying to understand whether uh, your use is a function of how many of your friends use the product. Okay, last question. Well, so maybe it's um, sort of a more general question, but I'll ask it in this context, which is, so one of the interesting things that happens, of course, in all these network studies is we're kind of wiping out personal effects. Yet when you look at these networks, there's so much around the fringe where you know, we do know those personal effects have a lot of differences. So I'm, you know, it's sort of in a sense almost a meta question. So if you want to go after that kind of thing to say who, who would be more tempted to do or how might we affect that, how would you even try to approach that when you're doing these very large scale studies? Yeah, so uh, really good question. 
Um, in the first study that I mentioned, we have this great data about the people, right? Age, gender, location, mobile device type. Is it a smartphone? Exactly what type of smartphone? How many page views do they have of different types of content, which proxies for their preferences? And the network variables are on top of all of that. And you're right, we're trying to hold that constant and look at how the network holding all of that constant uh, changes things. You can also focus in on the, uh, the individual characteristics, which is in part what I was saying to Michael, that maybe we want to see what the interaction of network and individual characteristics are. So, uh, you know, gender and having friends who adopt the product, or age and having friends who adopt the product, and the interactions. The, the really big problem in trying to understand whether networks have an effect are unobservables, the things you can't see about the people, which are typically embodied in the relationship between two people. I may know tons of things about two people, but the fact that they have a relationship will tell me you know, orders of magnitude more about their similarity than what I can observe about them. Yeah, I mean, again, you're talking network effects and things like age and stuff, which I understand. But for example, there have been studies in the trust literature which shows propensity to trust wipes out almost all the other effects when you actually do a controlled experiment between different people and things like that. So you can see things in the small that get wiped out in the large and vice versa. So it's sort of more of a question of how we put those kind of things together and, and make sure we're not seeing you know, some kind of curve right. over that that's really non-observable. Right, so, so in this case, uh, the, um, in, in the first study uh, with the 40 time varying variables, the, all of that stuff that you observe, very microscopic daily data on usage of the web, the mobile phone, your age, gender, location, the type of device you have, et cetera, doesn't wipe out the network effect. And in the case of the randomized experiment, these people are on expectation the same across all of those observable and unobservable dimensions, and that's the power of a randomized trial, is that it holds constant unobservable differences between people because on expectation when you randomize, people in the two groups are the same on even those unobservable dimensions. Okay, let's have our further discussion over drinks, and thanks, Sina, one more time. Thanks.